I've been working my way through a excellent book, Maritime Dominion and the Triumph of the Free World, by Peter Padfield, and is one of the best naval, uh, basically naval overall histories, um, or general histories that I've seen in recent years. Um, comes highly recommended by John Keegan, who's also one of my favorite military historians. One of the things that I'd like to focus on is kind of a synergy with uh, a excellent video that Drakenfels made about Kantai Kessen, uh, which is the Japanese decisive battle doctrine, um, which is based on the famous and influential American naval thinker, I think he's the, the Secretary of the Navy um, for the late 1800s or early 1900s, uh, Mehan, which is actually a ship that you could get in um, in the game of World of Warships. Uh, Alfred Thayer Mehan. So, yeah, John Keegan basically says Mehan is the most important American strategist of the 19th century. Um, he wrote this extremely influential book, which shows you that you can write books that change history. Uh, if you write them at the right time and you're in the right position, uh, called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. Um, and basically, he, in this book, you know, does something that's a little bit self serving to his career as a whole of, you know, being uh, a naval officer in the sense that he says that. If you're a Western power, if you're a country that borders one of the world's largest oceans um, in the 1600s, 1700s, that means the Atlantic Ocean because of opening up of the New World, forcibly of course. Um, and certainly America who has a border on the Pacific and the Atlantic at the same time. Uh, you need to at least control uh, the ocean that you're around in order to guarantee industrialization, basically. Um, America kind of famously has this as part of its history for the North and South conflict in the sense that even at the time of the American Revolution, much of the money was in the North, and specifically the Northern trade interests. Um, and in some modern historians' view, that's actually the real reason for the American Revolution in the first place, was so that uh, Northern wealthy trade merchants, who were the de facto political power and economic power, through economic power at their time period could just get a better deal on taxes. Um, you know, a lot of the lessons that American children learn about the American Revolution have to do with learning taxes. Um, Stamp Act, various degrees of, um, you know, the Boston Tea Party, the Intolerable Acts, um, all of these would be familiar to any sixth grader. And what are they, right? They're economic policies that influence political policies. Uh, but that's that's a little broad. <laughs> it's one of my one of my great curses as a historian is is I uh, am loath to to keep things narrow. So I, I always try to connect them to much, much bigger topics that are beyond the scope of this conversation. But Essentially, Japan um, is copying America in lots of ways during this time period because that's um, one of their strategies from, I believe, the Meiji Restoration is uh, the West seems to be doing well. They're certainly beating China. Uh, a lot of our history has been dominated by looking at China and seeing what's good. And uh, Japan is like, well... We got this new theory um, that certainly seems to be correct, looking at Britain. Um, how about we just go ahead and copy that? And Mehan, you know, 
in his foreword uses examples from ancient Athens to Rome, um, each of which is pretty specific about ex exactly how useful a control of the ocean is to your empire. Um, it's certainly influential for Rome's history. Um, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the Roman side of it, although one of my mentors, Professor Lee at UCSB, um, was a specialist for Greek naval warfare, and I've been recently reading through the Iliad again, and the amount of time that they say the word ships in the Iliad, even though they're not on them, is uh, massive. Uh, the entire second chapter is just a list of ships, where they came from, how they got there, and literally enabling one of the first stories uh, about military history in Western culture and Western civilization, um, which is essentially the Iliad is a giant amphibious landing, it, for lack of a you know a better comparison. Um, of course, the way that you would do that and the you know land battle siege around the city um, kind of defies modern categorization um, separating different activities into their constituent parts um, in ancient times of course you just need to do the entire project uh, you don't really care what it's called uh, you need to get there you need to set up your boats you need to um, use them as de facto homes for nine years essentially which is apparently what they're still doing at the beginning of the Iliad um, but yeah, I don't know, like, I, the thing I guess I wanted to offer isn't that, um, you know, if you're interested in these topics, by all means, please read, uh, you know, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by, uh, Thayer Mahan, and, of course, the, the book that is the title of this stream, um, I always advocate getting a hold of your original source, or at least secondary source documents. But it's the idea that different theories or philosophies become popular during different times across different countries and cultures, and that historians, part of their job is to dictate that is to be the next step in synthesizing that information and explaining it in cohesive, reasonable, and I'd say even persuasive ways to uh, politicians and theorists at their time period. Of course, you know, historians don't just do this for kicks, they do it for money, um, you know, and they have influence and are biased as they do this um, and of course if you're a country as influential economically as America is you could kind of shape and change what is popular at different time periods with different countries if you know that they're copying you or looking at you and in the case of Kantai Kesen to Japan's kind of detriment um, at least their early success with Russia, they were able to pull off, you know, decisive battle doctrine against a quite frankly outdated and older uh, fleet in the interwar period. But they weren't able to do it again against a more kind of modernized or larger force. And like, if you look right now, this Congo is a battle cruiser design or what should have been uh and later will turn into the fast battleship design um which is big guns on a platform that's speedy enough to catch up to something it wants to kill and run away from something it doesn't uh that it's afraid of um of course right now we're just going straight in because we're uh, se have severe overwhelming force uh, 
Um, but, you know, these concepts are designed to fight an enemy that is, quite frankly, stronger than you. Um, at least in the situations that you're finding yourself in. So, like, against this New York, it's a perfect example of uh, what the Congo may have gone up against during its time period. Um, and so you could see the Americans needed to have massive range to get across the Pacific Ocean. Um, and the Japanese fleet correctly assumed that because of the Mehan's doctrine of decisive battle, if there is conflict between Japan and America, the first thing they would do is send their fleet in one big blob over to the Philippines to take it back and, you know, gain territory and a very typically Western idea. And the Japanese fleet could simply pick them off while they're vulnerable steam across the Pacific Ocean uh, to get there. And that's what a lot of the destroyer tactics are in World of Warships. Um, if you play Japanese destroyers like I do, um, they're designed to be pound for pound better than their compatriots because they need to be, um, which is a tactic that small countries often use when they're outgunned or out economied by their rivals is each individual ship will be a little bit better than the other ship, so it's okay when you're outnumbered. Um, I think the Swedish have a, a great philosophy with their uh, tanks, which is, uh, we are too poor of a country to afford to build anything bad, <laughs> uh, which is a great aspect of Swedish design. Um, and I, Sweden has been employing this, I think, since like the 1600s with their ships. They couldn't afford very many ships, so the few ships that they did uh, purchase were like one and a half times ships and had like massive, massive amounts of armament and guns. And um, they actually, one of them famously like rolled over and sank the second it was deployed because it was uh, so top heavy. Um, uh, is it the Vega? I'll, I'll have to look it up. I don't. I don't have that information exactly on hand. But yeah, so, like I say, these ideas permeate, um, and there, there's only really a few ideas in, like, the directions that you can go. Um, one is ship big or ship small. Uh, France decided ship small was a better bet then ship big. Um, everyone that was in Britain had to deal with the fact that Britain literally did exist and could not uh, be gotten rid of. Oh, I sure hope our friends help out uh, with these two battleships looking at us. Not 100% sure they will. But we're gonna provide a diverse line of fire and, and see if we can, if we can get them. Yeah, there we go. No damage on the bounces. Appreciate that. Pretty good team. Oh, <laughs> that secondary gunner needs to adjust their forward sights. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's just a a thing that I am a little wary of in history um, because. The thing is, you don't know which idea is happening in your time period that is really, really dumb, that is going to get your country killed, um, that everyone just thinks is normal, that just thinks is like a, a good idea that everyone should do. Ooh, those are beautiful shots and disbursement. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Sometimes the Japanese guns uh, really, really play nicely with you. Not all the time, but sometimes. Yeah, see, this is an example of what the French would like to see. Uh, because they can't build as many big battleships as Britain, uh, they build lots of torpedo boats and say, you know, my very, very cheap torpedo boat will kill your very, very expensive battleship. And uh, that way you can get an economy of warfare that is amazing. Um, so as you can see, four destroyed, five citadels, 
106 damage. It's pretty good. Lots of lots of good team play. We'll check our score. Yeah, we top on the team by about 200. So yeah, and this is kind of you know where where we want to be. Um, I'm a bit more experienced than I'd say the average tier five player um, at this game. So yeah, I've been playing since beta, so uh, I guess we can expect some some of these good results. But yeah, our our opponent also did quite well. Um, you know, far out punched his team. Uh, so we'll we'll go ahead and give a, a compliment for this. And yeah, that's that's my ramblings. Is uh, I'm just curious about what anyone or myself thinks is the you know influential theory of the day um, as it pertains to high technology or the advantage that technology can give. Um, and we've seen that not be quite true in Vietnam. Um, it, I think history is still out on whether that's genuinely helping us in Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts. Um, I mean, it always technically does help you, um, but it also can allow you to get yourself in a corner that's very difficult to get out of, like the invention of the helicopter was for uh, the Vietnam conflict. Um, it allowed essentially bad decisions um, about you know, fighting the enemy without territory gain, um, or literally just removing the objectives from uh, military conflict and replacing them with just go and kill the enemy, like hunter killer missions, like find the enemy, then kill them. Um, and then that can go on forever, as literally as long as your enemy keeps supplying you with bodies, uh, which they, is really easy and cheap to do and they can kind of say my 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 soldiers are equivalent cost or cheaper than your soldiers so let's just continue to trade in a war of attrition that doesn't accomplish any real goals and then the political will of uh, rich expensive spoiled countries uh, run out partially because of uh, the liberal understanding of colonialism and fighting or in instilling violence on foreign countries rather than uh, the traditional form of sacred violence which is in defense almost only uh, which funny enough is a lot of what the Trojan War is about in the Iliad is um, is this conflict justified or should we go home <laughs> essentially um, and then the Trojans, of course, have always have uh, their conflict is thrown into question by why they're fighting in the first place over Helen. But, um, you know, it's always understood that you should be able to defend your city. The place where you live. And then that concept is just expanded out. But yeah, um, I know this is like a rambling of many, many topics, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to store this and record it and... Uh, pick out some themes or theories that I can use for uh, an application essay for grad school. Um, but yeah, be careful of ideas. Uh, you don't know the ones that you're already thinking latently, subconsciously, in your time period, because um, th that's just what's popular or what's educated. Um, you can see this in biology a bit with eugenics. Uh, funny enough, kind of in this time period also. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's it's pervasive in a sense that you can't really get a hold of until you get the perspective that history provides by separating you from it, um, you know, a little bit later in in history. So yeah, uh, Kantai Kessen, uh, an American doctrine when you're not America, can can kind of screw you over by baiting you into something you can't afford. Um, in this case, a, a decisive battle that never really comes uh, because you're always waiting for that big battle. You kind of slowly get chipped away through the course of the early war by reserving all of your battleships back and waiting for this big, big moment that never actually occurs. 
And when you get nervous that it's not going to occur, you try to force it. And then that, you know, you force it on bad terms. And military history is never kind to uh, you trying to make something work that really shouldn't be working. Of course, we say that, but uh, right before every battle is, you know, you have to overcome doubt and fear and do something that is fundamentally a bad idea, which is put your extreme, your life in danger. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of the privilege of historians to be like, oh, well, that didn't work out. You know, our job is hindsight. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Be like, oh, I should have done this. You know, but a lot of what the military is is doing something even though it's dangerous and making it work anyway. So it's a little little difference in perspectives there. It's important to be aware of the follies of your own profession when uh, judging or criticizing other professions, which is kind of what military history is fundamentally, which is, uh, it's just very clear in the military example where it's less clear in like economic or social history. Because at least we have a, a date and a time to point to in our... Uh, In our examination to be like this specific ship should not have been at this specific place at this specific time because it was a bad idea look how bad it was because <laughs> um, you lost but yeah I don't know I've been refreshing my understanding of the Pacific War um, partially because I'm a his military historian from the West Coast in America uh, from San Diego originally which is a historically one of the largest uh, naval yards on the west coast all right so it completely destroyed that flight of uh <laughs> of rocket planes yeah I could just kind of talk about the battle I guess that would be a bit more valuable and also easier for me. At least intellectually. Um, yep, so Japanese cruiser wants to stay at max range. Love very good Japanese high explosive at our targets. Um, I don't 100% know how accurate the armament type is versus just trying to balance something for multiplayer in a game which is also something you have to be careful of if you're I don't know essentially using video games as a replacement for um, a replacement for original source documents or like research um, which not to say that World of Warships doesn't have a, a trained talented uh, historian on their staff which I, I do believe that they do but their first priority is to make a fun video game and to make money off of that video game, which, you know, it's, this isn't a history book. It's a fun video game to play that interacts with history. And I try to constantly remind myself of that and, and to get back and do my, not let it make me complacent and do my actual work. Um, but yeah, it's, a little tempting to, to take the shortcuts of, of video games like stats as a symbol or at least indicative of um, the historical reality, but uh, you always have to check. <laughs> Job of history, constantly checking and rechecking to make sure you're right. Uh, I should have had AP loaded but punish that broadside as, as the Fuji turned. Um, I kind of want to torpedo this Bismarck. Um, the Fuji has some great, like, supplementary support equipment in the form of, I believe, radar. Um, all right, I'm going to switch to AP. Well, th these are too good of shots to mess up. I think it's here. He's just all the way sideways to me, and he's lit. Oh, get over there. Come on. 
Oh no, I missed. Oh, terrible. This back is going around this side. That's not great for me. Um, this Bismarck very easily could kill me right now. He's coming to a stop. A little suspicious. Whenever you're torpedoing has two strategies associated with it. One is to make sure that you hit uh, by going in pretty aggressively. The other is to um, just kind of box out an area, zone them out, and um, kind of hope for the best. Um, we're rushing, so we have AP loaded because we want to do a lot of damage in a short amount of time. This Bismarck is pretty successful in uh, reducing our ability to attack it. Coming around the side here would give us some shots at Magami, but exposes to two cruisers fire now. And uh, TD might be worth it. Uh, we have some smoke cover. I'm not sure how long it'll last, but it's a bold play. And this Magami is uh, a copy of us, I believe. There's, no, we're the Miyoko. So this is a tier above us. Hopefully our torpedoes can, you know, do some, give us some advantage here. The Dallas is not at a good angle to, um, oh, torpedoes are coming there. Oh, do some good damage. There we go. Could have, could have a good, uh, opportunity here. Alright, so I think our first priority needs to be to sink the Bismarck. Ah. Up, and then we got lots of bounces here. Alright, we're switching to AG. We're on fire, but we got lots of health to tank. I want to kill the DD to get just rid of its torpedo support. Got that. And then we're gonna see about getting really lucky and killing this Dallas. Not sure we'll be able to. Um, Oh. Wow, we're we're on fire so much. Seven ways from Sunday to the fire there. And then Ford, yep, four citadels with the Dallas. I think we can angle a little more, uh, but we're we might trade our lives for this at this point. Um, all right, so there we go. We're probably gonna die. We might make it out. Like might, like maybe, maybe. Um, oh, thanks guys. Yep. You gotta, you gotta do it for the stream. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we need to be careful of airplanes. Um, that was pretty nice. Yeah, I'm sure I'll make that into a video of some variety. Um, hopefully my prattling on about uh, naval history won't embarrass me later uh, in my limited understanding. And, you know, I never got a chance to take um, specifically World War II Pacific history. We just got um, history of Western civilization, which included World War II. And then, yeah. I, I guess I should stick more to like the specifics that I took in individual classes at UCSB. That would limit me to like pretty much ancient Greece and the Cold War um, were the two focuses that I could really afford to do, which is sad that you only <laughs> you only really have time in your life to really zero in and focus on a few things. But yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll accumulate some more focuses. Um, I really want to do World War One aviation history, uh, and I have a little, like a little bit of it, just from watching a bunch of documentaries. But yeah, that's that's the getting up above amateur rank in anything takes a lot of time and dedication and energy. So hopefully, we're accumulating that by just getting. A few more belts under our book every, sorry, books under our belt every year. And we'll work our way up from there. Um, but ideally, I'd like to, you know, talk about s sophisticated topics like Drakenfels. Um, but he's he's developed just one specialty of Navy. 
he's British, so he has uh, the ability to have quite a good pedigree. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I I feel kind of split between like being a generalist for military history from ancient to World War II to you know World War One and eighteen hundred stuff and revolutionary work. Um, because it's all just so good, and you know, and aviation history has been a light focus of mine, but it's difficult to like 100% uh, focus on that stuff partially because like there wasn't a lot of those classes when in my college uh, hmm so we do have a defensive fighter plane would be nice uh, but if we take Probably one more torpedo, we're, we're gonna die, or... Oh, here it comes. Looks like it's going for the Pensacola. That's a very rough target for an airplane to go after. Uh, American cruisers are notorious for having amazing DD, partially because of the shell fuses um, technology that they got. Oh, and we missed. No. Well, okay. I guess we can't have too great a game. And we ricocheted. Oh my. Does the Ranger have an armored hole, uh, armored deck? My. Yeah, look at those ricochets. Okay. That's, that's a little rough for me. Okay, it's gone. 